Hebrews chapter 3, please. Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. People debate who the author of this chapter is. Personally, I believe that it is the Apostle Paul. If the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote this passage, he is exhorting the people. He is encouraging the people to keep staying in the fight to serve God. Now remember, during Paul's time, they were suffering persecution. Nero was the ruler. People were being torn apart by lions. If he was writing to the Hebrews here, think about it. The Hebrews are already persecuted, criticized by their own loved ones. The Jews hated the Christians. They hated Paul's followers. So they were suffering tremendous persecution on all sides, criticized by their family and loved ones, suffering loneliness, suffering, uh, uh, suffering all kinds of turmoil. But they stood strong, and Paul believed that the importance was to be encouraged in the work they're involved with. Imagine a life, a church like that, going through so much turmoil, criticism, hardship, is a, is a life and the church worth living, worth working for? That's what Paul's trying to point out to them. He's trying to point out to them on that. Would anyone be like that? In Hebrews 3.13, he says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The Apostle Paul urges that it's important to be encouraged, to be stirred up. Why? Because, I mean, we're in the greatest life ever. We're in the greatest service ever. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. The world has unfortunately blinded our eyes to make us think that the life we live in is hardship. And Christianity is hard, don't get me wrong. But the world just keeps blinding your eyes that this is not a life worth living. There are other options that you could do in this life. As we keep serving God, we try to stir ourselves up, but it is, it is, to be honest, hard to stir ourselves up. Most of the time, it's discouragement. It's struggling. It's uh, worry. And then we're like, man, the Christian life is so tough. But I want this church to understand how important it is to stay motivated, to stay stirred up, to be encouraged that we are in the greatest work ever. By doing that, no matter how bad the turmoil is around you, you can stay happy. Yeah. You can feel like this is the life worth living, no matter how bad life is around you. No matter, and I mean it, no matter how bad life is around you. I mean, think about the people during Paul's time. They had it worse than you and I during persecution, criticized by their own kin and family and loved ones. But they were able to recognize that I can be encouraged, I can be happy, I can be stirred up with the service I'm doing for the Lord. Now that's hard for us to do, but it's important for us to do that. And I hope that this sermon can help you to figure out why I should go to church, why I should serve God, in spite of the sacrifice, hardship, and everything I go through. Why I can't skip serving God or a spiritual duty, no matter how hard it is. You know why? Because it's the best life worth living. You got something so exciting, so prized. So I hope that this sermon can help you recognize that. Will we, uh, shall we all bow in a word of prayer, Father? Will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit, the cleansing of your blood? Uh, this sermon can't come out right unless you use me, Father. Uh, I am totally unqualified. This is a sermon I struggled so much to uh, preach for you that can minister to the people. So I pray that you will please help me. I am the least qualified to preach this message, as I know many others can be better qualified. But uh, Lord, uh, you laid this on my heart. Lord, this is the message that I'm going to preach, so will you use it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now the first thing right here is that the author points out at verse 12, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. I mean, if Paul's a writer right here, he's preaching like many of us Bible believers are preaching. Be careful of sin. 
Don't depart from God. The world is so wicked. I know that temptation and the lust of the flesh is strong. And we just want to give up. We want to yield. Skip church. Skip Bible reading. Uh, delay our duty. You know, settle down with the world a bit. Like, give me a little bit of a break. I mean, that's what we're fighting. We have to take heed. We have to watch out for that. So we're preaching hard about, hey, be convicted over your sin. Be convicted about skipping your duty for the Lord. We're rebuking the sin. We're getting on ourselves. We're getting hard on ourselves that, hey, why are you so stupid to mess up in that thing again? Get, pick yourself up on your feet and serve God. So that's the preaching. That's the kind of mentality we have when we look at verse 12. So then notice right here at verse 13, Paul warns them about yielding to sin. He's preaching hard against it. You can tell by the language in verse 12, that's a hard preaching. It's a warning. It's a warning. It's negative. It's not positive. But you'll notice right here at verse 13, the natural thing is if in verse 12 he's warning them about sin, then the natural thing at verse 13 would be to rebuke to preach against the sin. It would be a negative sermon. If he said at verse 12, take heed lest you fall into sin, but I rebuke you of your sin, but I rebuke your weakness, but I rebuke your failings, but he did not say that. In verse 13 he said, but exhort one another daily. You know what exhort means? There's nothing wrong with rebuking. But Paul didn't put rebuke here. He put exhort. Why did he put exhort? Why is that a better word than rebuke? Because rebuking is important to us. We need to rebuke against sin. But Paul says there's something more to it than that. If you look up the word exhort, it does mean rebuke. It does mean to uh, warn, to try to get them away from sin. So the meaning of exhort includes rebuking. But that's not the only definition. Exhort means to motivate. Sometimes rebuking is used to get you to be more motivated to serve God. But a lot of times we use rebuking to not motivate ourselves. We use rebuking to discourage ourselves. As a matter of fact, we rebuke ourselves so much, that's the reason why if a person keeps messing up with the same sin problem, they have zero motivation to come back to church. Why? Because they rebuke themselves so hard, I'm stupid. Why did I mess up with the same thing again? I'm too weak, I'm pathetic. You know, uh, if I look at myself this way as being such a sinner, I wonder how pastor thinks of me. He probably already knows. I wonder what member so-and-so thinks of me. They probably already know. That discourages you from serving God. Rebuke is a good thing, but rebuke should be used to motivate ourselves to serve God, not the other way around. We preach against sin. We call out sin. I believe in the power of negative thinking. Dr. Ruckman wrote a book on that. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, believe it or not, uh, you start out with something negative. You're a sinner. You need to get right with God. You're going to burn in hell after you die. We believe in negativity. We believe in preaching hard. I never compromised on that. If there's one thing you know about this pastor in this church, you're in for a negative sermon. All right, I'm going to preach hard against something that's not going to be popular, and that might hurt your feelings, all right? So you already know that in this preaching. But brethren, we are just so into preaching so hard, rebuking so hard, that we turn that negative thing where we lose our motivation for the Lord, where we lose our encouragement for the Lord. And that's the reason why when you're so hard on yourself throughout the week, when you fail God or you're so weak, you have zero motivation to go to church because why bother? You're so hard on yourself. You're weak, so you're weak after all. Why bother coming to church? You're pathetic, so you're pathetic after all. Why bother coming to church? That's what floods in your mind. You know what you need to do? Take heed, like Paul says at verse 12, because sin's going to mess you up. But what? Rebuke? Be hard on yourself? No, it says but exhort. 
exhort, motivate yourself. You know what you ought to do when uh, you mess up in sin or you're weak or you're pathetic or the world's surrounding you and you're suffering so much and you're in pain? I mean, there is no joy of the Lord in you. It's sapped and that sin and the world and the devil seem to be shouting in victory. That's not a time where you go hard on yourself, but you motivate yourself like, man, praise the Lord, he saved my soul from hell. Praise the Lord, he's a forgiving God. Praise the Lord that he can use the base thing and the weak things for his glory. Man, get yourself up, man. I got a God who can pick me up, man. All right, then uh, don't you think you'll come to church after that? Try coming to church telling yourself you're pathetic. Try coming to church by telling yourself you're such a rotten sinner. Try to come to church by saying, you know, you failed God again and disappointed him. Try coming to church judging yourself. And then you're going to think about others judging you. Try to come to church after that. Try to pick up your Bible after that. Try to pray after that. There's no spirit within you. Unless you motivate that spirit and stir that spirit that, hey, praise the Lord, he can forgive me, he can use me. I can't wait to hear the word of God. I can't wait to pray to him. I can't wait to hear the singing that will stir me up. I can't wait to hear the preaching. Yes, it'll rebuke, but it'll motivate me to do a fresh start for Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's, that's the spirit, man. Amen. That's the spirit. You know uh, why people are afraid sometimes to enter the ministry? It's because they think it's so hard. They think it's scary. It's so tough. You know why some people are afraid to serve God in a Bible-believing church or get involved in a Bible-believing work? Because the devil's going to attack me. Because I'm afraid that I'm going to come across those issues that the that I've heard Bible believers warn me about, that there's going to be people there, your best friend will betray you. It's best that I don't get involved with people in the church to begin with, that way I don't feel that. You know, some people, they don't want to serve God because they hear so much about, hey, you have to sacrifice this worldly thing, you can't do that fun thing, you can't do that thing that will make you happy. Why? Because they're worldly, they're sinful. So, you know what? There's nothing joyous in my life to serve God. Nothing happy in my life to serve God. You know, that is the impression that Bible believers are unfortunately giving. And you're the evidence of that. You're the Bible believer who told yourself that. My friend, the Bible believing life is the greatest thing ever. Entering the ministry, the mission call is the highest call that God can give. What an honor. What a privilege. My friend, I wouldn't trade anything in the world. You give me a job of a millionaire or preaching on the pulpit, I would not hesitate to grab this pulpit and preach out of that book. You might say, why? I wouldn't trade a million dollars for people's tears on the altar. I wouldn't trade a million dollars to see hundreds of souls get saved by me just opening up a 99-cent King James Bible. I wouldn't trade anything in the world for that one. Man, oh, the Holy Spirit power and the fruits and the miracles that God has done in my life. What joy! Sacrificing the world? That's a small price to pay. Why? Because I'll trade it off for the blessings of God. Just getting rid of the world doesn't mean I'm getting rid of my happiness. Getting rid of the world means that I can finally get the blessings from God. God promised me... Didn't you know God, my God, owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Don't you know this world is already created by God? He can give you more than just the world. I don't own just the world. 1 Corinthians 3 says the world, the universe, the heaven, and all are mine. All are mine to own. I can finally get unlimited access to the blessings of God if I finally get rid of those petty things called my job. Call my possessions. Call my sins. Call my worldly little trinkets. Finally, I let go of those things. I can taste the blessing of God. You know why you young people are not happy with your Christianity? Because you think Christianity robs you of your joy. Because this is worldly. This is sinful. This is, oh, so then you brainwash yourself into thinking there's nothing happy about the Christian life. No, get rid of that world so that God can finally bless your life. You never tasted the blessing of God, that's why. Once you taste it, man, and talk to some of these people here, they'll gladly lay down the world for the blessing of God. Have you seen God work miracles in your life? God answer your prayers? God give you even the worldly things you sacrifice back to you? God sometimes does that. 
I mean, it's amazing what the Lord can do. What a life, man. Why are people afraid to getting into the ministry? Why are people afraid to preach the word of God from this pulpit? Why are people afraid to get involved in a Bible-believing church? Why are people afraid to climb higher, so to speak? Climb higher to get more accountability, responsibility in working in God's ministry. My friend, you're in the greatest life ever. That's not, oh, I'm marrying into suffering. I'm marrying into persecution. I'm marrying into people criticizing me. Look, I get that. I get that. True. We get that. But when you think about that, guess what? In any decision in life that you make, you're going to go through some of that. Right. All right? People think, I'm not ready for this higher calling from God because I'm just not ready for the negativity. I'm just not ready for the sacrifice or the pain. Guess what? Even if you think yourself to be ready, when you get in it, you'll never be ready. No one is ever ready, and there is no such thing as being free from problems and being totally prepared to enter a ministry for the Lord. There's no such thing. It'll happen anyway where you least expect. Problems will happen. Just go through the problems. That's it. Don't just live in fear. Oh, the problems are going to come. Problems are going to come. And then think you're ready for it. And guess what? Problems still happen. You know what? Just thrust yourself in. Thrust yourself into the work of the Lord. I'm not telling you to get outside the will of God, rush ahead the will of God. But if God has given you an open opportunity to do something, that's a time to be so motivated and say, I can't wait to get involved in working for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's no higher calling than that. What a great lie. The greatest of my life was when I entered the ministry, not when I was outside of the ministry. You know that? If I were to write my bio, all the exciting stuff would be my times in the ministry, not outside of that. Wow, what a horrible life, man. Man, pastor, I see you're so tired all the time. I know the stress that you're going through, the pain that you're going through and all that. My friend, any uh, exciting position in life will have its sacrifices. Any big position in life, important position in life, will have its sacrifices. That don't mean that I'm going to miss out a lot of fun and joy. I promised, I told my wife when we got married that, hey, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice and hardship. I wanted her to know that. But I told her this, but I promise you one thing. I promise you that it will not be boring when you marry me. I kept my word, man. It was never boring. It was the time of our lives. She's living the time of our life. She don't regret in marrying me. She said that was the, the most happiest of my life was when I married you. But what about the pain? What about the struggles? What about people betraying us, talking behind our backs, the hardship, and then the stress after stress, suffering after suffering? Well, what about all that? She don't think about that. She's having so much of the time of her life. You know, your problem is you don't want to serve God. All you're thinking about is the negative, the negative, the negative. No matter what decision you make in life, you will face something negative. If you had a choice which negative thing you'll pick, I'd pick serving the Lord. I'd pick serving the Lord. That's, that's the thing that I would pick. You're going to go through anything negative in life, all right? Might as well be serving God. What a time, man. What a life. So come to church. Get involved in the Bible-believing work. Start soul winning, man. Start street preaching. Start holding a sign. Start passing out a track. Man, you're missing out. I'll tell you what. You're missing. Oh, but the criticisms and the, how the people will think of me. And I have to wake up in the morning and then I have to sacrifice time from work and too little of a price to pay, man. Too little of a price to pay. This is the joy of the Lord. You're missing out, man. Don't miss out. Don't miss out the fun. Some of you are missing out so much fun. So much fun. Man, the times that we have in fellowship, and there were times that we had in summer camp, the times we had in our revival meetings, the times we had just days to ourselves, man, you don't know what you're missing out. You heard that testimony that I gave to you about our work reaching worldwide? You know what that was? That was something I partook in that you didn't partake in. What if you partook in that too? That's why we're starting our church trip. See? Oh, man, imagine. Wow. Imagine, man, the joy. Don't miss out the fun. Wow. Yeah. So you know what you need to do to get yourself serving God? Stop rebuking. Stop preaching hard against yourself, but rather try to uh, preach hard and rebuke to motivate you. 
Exhort yourself to serve God. Exhort yourself to serve God. Say, man, I'm going to miss out. It's so much fun. It's so much fun singing a hymn, just hearing the word of God preach. Think about that. Rather than thinking about, oh, I'm too tired and I got to push myself. It's such a struggle to come to church. <laughs> come on, man. That's why you make it so hard on yourself. Some, yes, the Christian life is hard, but I believe a lot of times we make it harder than we think. We're going to realize how little of a price it is to pay to be criticized by some loved one when we get into the house of God and we receive encouragement from so many brethren around us. Man, don't miss out. Notice right here at verse 13, but exhort one another, one another. So you know what that means? That means how can you encourage each other unless you're together, right? Right? I mean, Paul that time did not have internet. So what do you think he meant by that? Okay. He meant actually being together. That means church. Yeah. That means church. So it's important that we meet together so that we can encourage each other. You want evidence? Hebrews 3, by context, is Hebrews 10.25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So that's a local assembly. All right? That's plainly church. As a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Amen. That matches with the verse we read. Exhorting one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. So that's referring to, hey, if you want to receive motivation, you need to get to church. Amen. You know, what Paul said, he did not say Sunday main service, not forsaking Sunday main service at 12 p.m. He never said that. What he meant was every time we assemble together, Every time we assemble together, soul, win, soul winning, a Wednesday, a weekday, an off day, whenever the people have fellowship on a day that you might be busy, something like that, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Why? Because that's where we receive exhortation. We receive motivation. That's why it's so important to me. There are people who might say, well, you know, church is not for me. I watch you all the time, Pastor Kim. You know, the mistake that you will make is, I can't come to church today, but uh, I won't miss church because I'm going to be watching you online. That's a mistake that you don't want to say, you don't want to make. Now, look, I thank God for our internet. Sometimes there are things that can't be helped, and I'm glad that at least you can watch us online so you don't miss out church. But you got to realize, look, this is for people who watch us online, and maybe some of us are caught guilty with this, but we turn it to a way where internet can be our assembly, our encouragement, rather than actually meeting in church. And that is one of the most dangerous things that you can meet. You want evidence of that? I'll give you evidence. Ask uh, Brother Jacob and ask Brother Jared. They watch me online, so they must have attended church. But meeting here and fellowshipping is a lot more different encouragement. Don't you think so? Look, I got 80% of people right here who watch me before on the internet and they can tell you there's something different about meeting each other and that really stirs you up compared with just watching on a screen like a couch potato. There's a huge difference, man. Get involved in a local Bible-believing church. Some of you watching us online, we have a church directory on our website. I said it so many times. Find a local Bible-believing church. Some of you might say, well, I looked at the directory. I can't find it. Then find a church that's close to us. You can go to kjvchurches.com. There are independent fundamental Baptist churches that only use the King James Bible everywhere, where they're not Bible-believing like you. Well, at least, you know, a B grade, church is better than an F grade. What is F grade? Your flesh. Just that some assembly is better. Some assembly is better. If you got an A grade church, a Bible believing church that you can meet, then I would choose that one than a B grade. I mean, the point is meet together. Meet together so you can be encouraged. Well, pastor, you don't know me and you don't know what I'm going through and uh, you don't know what it's like. Well, Paul knew. Paul knows exactly what it's like to be by himself and where he spiritually, listen, he's spiritually strong and studying the word of God just fine himself. He knew what it's like. 
but he recognized, I need church. You might say, where's the evidence? Look at Acts. Acts 11. Didn't you know that Paul, for a couple of years, was trained by God himself? That's the greatest learning he can get. I mean, if you think that your spiritual life is right with God being by yourself and you don't need church, Paul was sure a lot better than yours. Without church, he had one-on-one -on -one training with God in the desert, a couple of years, without church. But you know what Paul realized? I need church. Why? I need the exhortation. Look at Acts chapter 11. Look at this, Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. The Bible says that at verse 22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So this is a church, a local church in Antioch, who when he came and had what? Seen the grace of God was glad and what? Exhort. exhort. So he can exhort. Why? Because he's in a local church. So in a local church assembly, you receive exhortation. So what did Barnabas do at verse 25? Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to what? Saul. That's Paul's old name. That's referring to Paul. Verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. See, the local church in Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they, what? Assembled themselves with the church. How about that? Paul assembled with them. But he already knew enough Bible. He had a great spiritual relationship with God without a church, so he should be fine. No, Paul realized that I need a local Bible-believing church. Why? Because the verse pointed out, verse 23, that's where you receive exhortation. That's where you see exhortation. Look, I know we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. I know you're supposed to be strong for Jesus no matter how lonely you are, okay? But let's be honest if we are human nature and you're honest about yourself, all right? We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We have to be strong in the Lord. We have to believe His promises are true and we have to resist the world. We have to be strong. But we, we are weak and our human nature cries out, I need to see something. I need to see something. I need to feel something. That's what we have in us if we're honest human nature. You know where you can get that? Verse 23, a local church. The Bible says they seen the grace of God. He was glad. Look at that. He felt and saw something. If you want to see God's fruit, if you want to see God's power, God's miracles, rather than just believing and just tr uh, holding on to your faith, no, I believe that God's promise is real and he'll minister and that what I have is the truth and this world is wicked and simple. Hey, man, get yourselves into a Bible-believing church and you will see that. You're going to see people who will testify the consequence of sin. You're going to see people whose lives got changed because of Jesus Christ. You're going to feel the joy of the Lord when you fellowship. You're going to feel the joy of the Lord when you sing the hymns with other brethren around you. When you hear the preaching of the Word of God, you're going to see that right in your face, man. Rather than some digital picture. Man, human interaction. A believer who's saved like you is better than some digital makeup that has no Holy Spirit in it. Man, get involved in a Bible-believing church. Why? Because you need to, if you're honest, you need to see something. You need to feel something. Closest you can get to that is a local Bible-believing church. How many times have I heard some people after a summer camp or a blowout, man, I got a taste of heaven. Yeah. You know why? They saw it. They felt it. It's not heaven itself, but that's the closest to heaven that you're going to get. Yes. Amen. Amen. You want heaven? You want to feel heaven? Why not get a bit of that right now? Yes. Oh, I just have to enjoy. I feel like traveling on. Be lonely. Wore it out. This world's not my home. I want Jesus to rapture me so soon because I hate this world and it's so wicked. Hey, man, you can get a little bit of heaven right now. Get your butt into a Bible-believing church. Yes. Thank you, Lord. That'll, that'll keep you motivated. Yes. Motivated to serve God. 
Nothing like when your flesh is down and you don't feel like serving God, a bunch of brethren around you getting you stirred up to serve God. All right, go to Hebrews 3 again. Hebrews 3. Notice right here, exhort one another daily. Daily. Paul, he says that it's so important to encourage yourself every day, to motivate yourself every day. Hmm. Paul believed in that so strongly that 1 Thessalonians 5, he said, rejoice evermore. What does that mean? You're supposed to constantly rejoice and be happy in God. Now, when I read that verse, I'm like, that's a pretty hard rule to follow. I can't rejoice all the time like Paul. But you know what? I don't think Paul, it's not like how we think that Paul, it was so easy. It was natural for him to just always be happy. When he's persecuted, whipped, and then shipwrecked, I don't think that Paul, it just came so easily for him that uh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistakes. No, I don't think it was like that. I think he had the same feelings like you. It's tough. It's hard. It's painful. But why was he able to still rejoice? Because of 2 Corinthians 2. What did he mean by rejoice evermore? Rejoice evermore. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. How do you constantly motivate, encourage yourself to be happy when you're persecuted, when you're shipwrecked? I don't know how Paul did it because he's such a stronger Christian than me. No, 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 no. He went through the same things like you. He had the same feelings like you when going through distress. He don't jump around and run around the basis when distress happens. I believe he gets heavy. He feels depressed and down. The evidence is 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10. What did he say? As sorrowful. He's talking about himself. He goes through sorrow, yet what? Always rejoicing. That's what he meant that he rejoices evermore, that he encourages himself every day. What he meant by that is, I go through the same feelings like you. When bad times happen, it's natural to feel like whining, to feel down, to feel like everything forsaken you. That's natural. I sorrow like you, but at the same time, I'm rejoicing. How do you do that? It's called, if you can guess, how do you do that? It's called the spirit versus the flesh. So the flesh... I mean, let's be honest, when we go through something bad, I mean, I'll, if I'm going to be honest with you, my flesh don't feel happy right now, okay? So I just feel so down. I'm, I'm supposed to preach an encouraging sermon. My flesh right now don't feel that encouraged, okay? So I'm like, man, this is a horrible timing, you know? But the thing is, is that even though my flesh feels like that, the spirit within me yeah. is saying... Man, God's been good to you. Yes. Man, you got something real that not, nobody else has. Man, the Word of God has power. The Holy Spirit can move and burn upon your heart. Glory to God. Isn't it marvelous and wonderful? Amen. You know what my flesh does when I'm singing that song? It's marvelous and wonderful. What Jesus has done for the soul of mine, the half has never been told. My spirit is crying out with joy, but my flesh is saying, I don't feel that. Yes. My flesh is saying it don't feel like it. My flesh is like, you're so tired, you know. That's what my flesh is doing. That's why Paul said it's important why he said rejoicing always. That's good. Why you exhort daily. Because your spirit has to stay in the positive mood yeah. whenever your flesh feels negative. That's right. That's good. So in other words, you're fighting the flesh. Amen. So you're forcing your flesh to die, to be crucified, and you're forcing that spirit to become alive in you with joy and rejoicing. Yeah, amen. So what does that mean? You have to force the encouragement daily. Yeah. Well, you know, it feels like it's fake. No, it's called warfare. warfare yeah. It's called killing your flesh. That's what it is. It's not fake. It's real, actually. Yeah. It's real. You're trying to crucify the flesh, and you're trying to liven your spirit. That's, it's called war. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when you daily, consistently concentrate on, man, God's so good. God saved my soul from hell. His blessings are real and all that. When you keep 
concentrating on that eventually, and you keep crucifying and killing this flesh eventually, you do feel and you do know that, man, actually, yeah, I am happy that Jesus saved my soul. I am happy that God gave me a Bible-believing church. I thank God that he delivered me from so many problems in my life to where I should have been shot to hell a long time ago. That's what's going to happen. Who feels happy when they drag themselves to church? You know, you drag yourself to church, hello, hello, hello. But then, you know, when you force yourself to fellowship, when you force yourself to sing, when you force yourself to shut up your flesh and listen and hear the word of God, what happens? Wow, glory to God! You feel dead now? You know why? You forced yourself to be happy. Keep forcing and forcing it, you will be happy. Keep forcing and forcing that flesh to shut up and the flesh crying and whining will shut up. You want to be happy? Make yourself happy. That's it. Make yourself happy. Make yourself happy. What's today's memory verse? I think myself happy. King Agrippa. He has to put it to work. When you do that, you'll be happy. Well, I don't believe you. No, you believe me because you don't... Every time you dragged your dead butt into church, you always were happy when you left. You always left happy. You always left satisfied. You know what that's called? You forced your flesh to come to church. Yeah. See, you gotta, if you want joy, things take a little bit of force. Okay. All right, so you want to be motivated to serve God. You want to be happy. You want to be stirred up. Then keep forcing it. Yes. And then it'll come out. Yes. Joy will come out. Notice the next part of verse 13. It says, while it is called today. While it is called today. You know why you got to exhort yourself, motivate yourself to serve God? Because it's a time limit. Yeah. Paul says, while it is called today. That's why you got to exhort yourselves. If you don't encourage yourself to serve God, that time will pass and you can't get it back. Yeah. Yeah, Didn't you know there are some people where it's too late and they can't come back to church anymore? They can't come back to God anymore. Why? They had that, that time that God keeps giving them a chance, a chance. But they went so far down, they rejected it. If only they would take that chance. If only they would take that chance. Some of them are too late. To be honest, it's never too late. They can always return. Yeah. But they've reached a point of no return where they're so drowning themselves in discouragement and sin that nothing you do can encourage them back into church. That's how dangerous your discouragement can be. Yeah. That's how dangerous your sin can be. Even if, you, if it's never too late for them and you leave the door open, for them it's too late. That's why while it's called today, get yourself to serve God. Encourage yourself to get involved in something for the Lord. Be stirred up. Be stirred up to do something for God. Yeah while it is called today because you won't get that back why there are some people who missed out a specific church service where they could have gotten a blessing yeah. but they missed out yeah. you know the thing is this a lot of people don't think about it notice that at verse 15 right 15 while it is said today that matches with verse 13, right? While it is said today at verse 15, if ye will hear his voice. You know why God puts a time limit on that? Because that could be the day where you, God just might speak to you about something that will fill up your soul, that might minister yeah. to you, that might help you. Yeah. How many have you missed out how many have you missed out? There could have been something that God spoke to you. God could have met you if you just held on a little longer. If you just didn't bail out that day and time. It could have been the thing that could have saved your life. Could have saved your family. Could have maybe saved a lost soul maybe that you've been praying for. Could have been the answer to prayer you've been waiting for a long time. That could have been the day if you went, if you held on. 
Look at uh, John 9. John 9. Jesus recognized that. He says, I must do the work while it is day. That's the same thing with Paul. Exhort yourself. Serve God while it is called today. That's what Paul and Jesus knew. Look at John chapter 9. Look at this. Verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. See, Jesus realized that verse 4 his day, his time is limited. That's why he must do the work, because it will run out one day. Here there is a blind man who needs healing from God, who passed by. This blind man never even asked Jesus to heal him. You know what Jesus did? No, I'm going to heal him. Why? Because that could be my time, my opportunity. I may not get a chance like this again. I must do the work. Based on what, though? Why is it important that Jesus had to do it? Why is his time limited? Because of verse 3. 3 is the key. That the works of God should be made manifest in him. You know why he had to heal him? So that God's work can be made manifest. So that the miracle can come out. People can see the miracle. See the joy of the Lord, of the blind man getting healed. Man, what a happy moment you wouldn't trade for. Wouldn't you love to see a show like that? <laughs> I would love to see a show like that. A person who's so blind and all of a sudden see. Yeah. Oh, what a thing to see, man. Yeah. People try to do miracles today. That's why they do magic shows. But we know that's all just tricks. Yeah. But this is a real thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone would pay money and entrance fee to see all of that. But Jesus can only create a happy moment like that. The works of God can be made manifest because he took advantage and said, I have a limited time, so I need to do this now. now. I need to do it now. Yeah. If he didn't do it now, they would have lost one of the greatest shows of all time. You know why? You can't miss out that day. That day, that could be the day the work of God is made manifest. That could be the day that God's miracle can come out and you want to trade the show for all the world. Think of all the miracles and the fruits you went through. Those only happen when you went through that day. If you missed out that day, then that particular day, God won't give that miracle. Missed out. Makes you thankful. Man, I sure I'm glad I didn't miss out that day. Man, now I have a fruit that I could put on my shelf, a miracle I can put in my shelf, some excitement in my life I can put in my shelf. Man, I thank God I didn't miss that day. Makes you grateful, right? How much more so if you would get involved with the Lord? Man, do you know how many excitements you've missed out? Pastor, you got so much excitement, so much testimonies. I'm sure mine pales against yours. My friend, that doesn't have to be the case. You can join it too. As a matter of fact, you can have more than mine. You can have more than mine. Get into a life, a work of service for God that's majority of the time in your life. And guess what? You're not going to miss out the miracle of God, bud. What I've given to you this morning is just a little bit of taste of God's miracle in my own life. Just a little bit. If I gave you the full story, man, you go, you'd be so pumped up that you'd charge hell with a squirt gun right now. That's cool. But what if I were to tell you you can have even more than that? That's good. You know why? Just get involved in the work of God. Amen. Come on. Stop wasting your time in the world with TV, video games, Amen. your own entertainment in the world, your own things to do in life. Put that in a biography. It's a boring story. Yeah. You missed out the fun, man. You missed out the games. You missed out the joy, man. That's good. You missed out the conflict. You missed out the drama, man. So grab it while it is called today. Because that could be the day God has done the miracle that you're missing out. 
you miss out that particular day, might be that day that the miracle is happening. Don't miss out. The next part of the verse says, in verse 13, lest any of you be hardened. Lest any of you be hardened. How did the Jews become hardened if they don't encourage each other? How do you become hardened? It becomes at verse 8. So Paul explains how you can become hardened if you don't encourage yourself. What does hardened mean? Hardened means that the heart is still. It's tight. It's stiff. If your heart is stirred up, what does that mean? The heart is moving. It's pumping. It's going. It's not hard and still. You want your heart stirred up to serve God? You want that? Well, then you need to do this. This is why your heart's hardened. Have you felt your heart hardened today? Do you feel stirred up? Do you really, be honest, do you really feel stirred up for the Lord right now? Yes. Do you feel stirred up to serve God? Do you feel stirred up to take away sin? Do you feel stirred up to do something for the Lord? Do you feel stirred up to sow it? Do you feel stirred up to do something great for the Lord? Just got none of that right now, right? You're just dead. Just still, just, I just want to do nothing. You feel that, right? That's probably how you feel. The reason why is this. Verse 8. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. So notice right here, these Jews who went through the wilderness with Moses, their hearts got hardened. They weren't stirred. Why? Because, in verse 9, saw my works 40 years, Wherefore I was greed with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. The reason why their heart got hardened is because they didn't know. They didn't keep in their minds what they saw from the mighty works of God. You know, the thing is this, is that do you realize that if you were one of those Jews that time, I know the wilderness is a long and hard road, and man, I mean, uh, you don't, you're not in the promised land yet, and man, it's so hot, and uh, you're just marching and marching and marching, and you're wandering like a nomad, and you feel like whining, you feel like complaining. But, you know, if you were that Jew, man, do you realize that they were living the most exciting life ever in spite of that wandering in the wilderness? They were living in the most exciting life that even Hollywood gave it a five-star rating called a movie called The Ten Commandments. Why? Why do they put a story like that if their life is so dreary, boring, nothing excitement? The Bible's a boring book. Then why do you hit five-star ratings then? I don't get that. You know why? Because God's life, that story that they're living in is, pro is one of the most exciting stories that it will hit any movie t theater show and people will flock to see it. Do those Jews realize what kind of a movie, what kind of exciting scenery they were living in? What story they were in? They were living in one of the most exciting lives. Still boasted about that Red Sea split in half and the audience, when they watch that, their heart just bends and when that water just crashes the Egyptians, wipes out all their enemies, they were at odds. They're just a bunch of slaves. Nobody. And they just ruined the world's most powerful empire. What a story, man. What a climax. God raining bread from heaven. Bread from heaven. What a miracle. What a God. These were the Jews that were going to conquer giants. Giants and monsters. Who wouldn't pay to watch a movie about a guy killing Superman? Yeah. Or a smaller guy beating a giant? Yeah. Why do you think David and Goliath is such a popular story? Right. Why do you think people like Rocky beating up a taller guy in the boxing ring? You know why? It's the excitement. It's the drama. And those Jews were living in it. Man, if I were one of those Jews, I would go, when I'm walking in the wilderness, i go, man, so what? So what if I'm a no bad? There are people out there who are lost, who are nomads like me anyway. I'm not the only nomad in the wilderness. There are plenty of people who are going through the heat of the wilderness, wandering and stuff like that. 
I got to realize, man, that I'm living in one of the most exciting moments in my life and I'm excited for Jesus Christ and God has given me something that will stir me up. I'm in a drama. I'm in a movie. I'm in one of the most exciting moments in history. Amen. In history. Man, if I were one of the Jews, I would go, this ain't nothing, man. Everybody goes through wilderness wandering. I'm not the only one. Don't, do you think those Jews were the only nomads in the wilderness? There were plenty of nomads in the wilderness. They weren't the only ones. Every, those Jews were just so spoiled, see? Just whining about any problem they go through. Whining about problems that every other people goes through. That's what they were doing. <laughs> They should have said, man, everybody goes through that. But the difference with me is I'm living in one of the most exciting dramas in history. That's a huge difference. Your problem, my friend, is that when you're going through your wilderness wandering, you're like, the Christian life's so hard. I'm so unique. The devil's onto my tail. And then, oh, it's so hard. What a sacrifice to serve Jesus Christ. Oh, it's so miserable. I want to die and go to heaven. And I'm just sacrificing so much, staying away from sin and fun. And I did it all for you, Lord. No, you did it all for yourself. That's your problem. You're just going through problems like every other person is going through. There's nothing special about you. There are plenty of nomads like you. There are plenty of people with family problems like you. Plenty of people with health problems like you. Plenty of people who go through loneliness problems like you. Plenty of people who go through turmoil like you. Plenty of people who go through uh, mental deficits, health deficits like you. Plenty of people who go through depression like you. You're not the special. You're not the only one. But I'll tell you what's special about you. I'll tell you what's unique. You're just like any other person who may be going through problems, but you stand out in living one of the most exciting dramas in history. We're this close, this close till Jesus comes again, man. We are at odds against the world. The whole world wants to shut us down. We are against the world's largest religions, the world's greatest system, the world's higher education. And here's a bunch of nobodies who believe a 99 cent book who conquer all of that. Exciting, man. What a, one of the most exciting times in our life. You want to bail this out? Bail it out, man. Man, what an excitement, man. How many odds and challenges have we faced through? And we overcame it all by the grace of Jesus Christ. When you think about that, your heart don't get stirred up. Your heart don't get stirred up. You know what you need to do? You need to look at all like those Jews failed to do. They did not look. They did not know about the miracles God did. You need to look through the miracles God did, the excitements that God put you through, the answers to prayer where odds were stacked against it that God put you through. Our enemies surrounding us in public schools and government and the neighbors and the world all stacked up against us, how we stood up in victory. You need to remember those. Yeah. And then you'll be appreciative of the life you're living in rather than underappreciating it or complaining about it. Jew wandering in the wilderness. That's what you're doing. Another thing right here is, notice the last part of verse 13, through the deceitfulness of sin. See, if you don't exhort yourself, if you don't stir yourself to serve God, you're going to fall into sin. You know what I think Paul was doing when he wrote it? I think he was probably writing about himself. What? The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian who ever lived? That man like that wouldn't mess up in sin? Well, the reason why I think he might be including himself is verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence. See, notice right here that verse 13, even though he was saying... You be careful, lest you be deceived by sin. But he put himself in we, the next passage. Why? Because when he was talking to you, he was thinking about himself. You know, a lot of times when I preach a sermon and when I go, you, 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 you'd be surprised how many I see myself in the picture. I think Paul was just a typical preacher preaching against you, 
but he includes himself. You know what he said here? You've got to exhort lest. You see that at verse 13? Exhort. What happens if you don't exhort? Lest you be hardened through sin. What does that mean? The verse did not say exhort one another and do not be deceived by sin. It didn't say that. It said lest. That means this. If you don't exhort yourself, you will fall into sin. It's a one-way ticket. There's no options there. No, it will happen. It must happen. That's what he meant. Paul himself, the greatest Christian who ever lived? Yes, I believe that. You might say, how do you know? Because of Romans 7. Look at the wording here, Romans 7 and Hebrews 3, all right? Look at the wording of Romans 7 and Hebrews 3. Paul said to exhort lest sin deceives you, right? Notice that Paul acknowledges that sin deceived him. Why? Why was sin able to deceive him? Because look at this verse. Romans chapter 7, verse 11. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, what? Deceived me. So Paul said that sin can deceive him. Well, how does sin deceive him? Look at verse 14. He explains the commandment's not the problem. It's his sinful nature. Yeah. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but what? I am carnal, sold under sin. He, present tense. Not past, present. He says that sin can deceive him. Why? Because of his fleshly nature. That is carnal, sold under sin. Yes. Listen, my friend, I believe that the Holy Spirit can give you victory over the flesh, but I don't believe the Holy Spirit gives you victory where it eradicates the flesh. Yes. The flesh and the lust, the carnality, will always remain till the day you die. Yes. It's in there. Why? Because you have two natures. Not one nature, you have two. You have spirit and, and, and flesh whether you like it or not. So your flesh is carnal. So then think about it. If you don't spend time in the spirit, what's inevitable then? The flesh. Inevitable. Well, I don't think that if I encourage myself to do something spiritual for the Lord, I'm going to fall to the sin of my flesh. Guarantee yes. Paul said he is. What makes you think you're a better and more spiritually powerful than the apostle Paul? You must be really spiritually powerful if you think that you don't have to encourage yourself in the spirit to serve God and that I won't fall into sin, though. I won't fall into sin. No, you will. That verse says, exhort lest you fall into the deceitfulness of sin. And Paul says, sin deceived me because of the carnality of my flesh. Why is it, Pastor, if I don't exhort myself, encourage myself in the spirit that I will fall into the flesh? Simple. Because you crave for something real. I don't care who you are. You know what the, why a lot of young people fall away from Christianity? They don't see something real in Christianity. Every young person wants something real, something meaningful in their lives but they feel like their whole world is just a dead tradition or system. That's what some of you are feeling. You got something real. You crave for something real. You crave for something that has meaning, for joy. Everybody craves for something to make them happy. If you don't do the spirit, it's inevitable the flesh. That's why you spend so much time in sin. That's why you spend so much time with the wrong crowds. Spend so much time in drugs or in the things that you watch, the things you listen to. Why? You're trying to give, find something to give you joy. See, if you don't stir yourself, encourage yourself in something spiritual, you will crave for something. You will crave for something. And if there's nothing spiritual, it's inevitable you will fall to the flesh. You will crave for the flesh. That's why it's so important to stir yourself up spiritually. 
Because why? Some of you are in danger of craving sin. Do you realize that? If you don't stir yourself up to serve God in this church, you are in danger of stirring yourself up to sin as soon as this church service is over. Why do you think you still fall into the same fleshly weaknesses, the worldly problems, the sins over and over again? Because you're craving for something. That's why you did not replace that cra craving with something spiritual. Stir yourself. Stir yourself. I want to sing a hymn. I want to fellowship with the brethren. I want to win souls. I want to read that book. I want to pray to the Lord. There's meaning in life. There's more joy. I want the blessings of God above the worldly blessings in life. When you crave so much of that and you're so busy in that, you have no time to crave for something sinful or worldly. But get rid of the spiritual crave. You got plenty of time to crave for sin. Plenty of time to crave for the world. That's why stir yourself up to serve God. Stir yourself up to read that book, to pray, to come to church, to come to soul winning. Don't beat yourself over the head. Oh, it's so hard to come to church. Oh, it's so hard to read the Bible. Oh, it's a sacrifice if I preach on the pulpit. People are going to criticize me. No, no, no. Paul said, but exhort, not but preach negatively, but rebuke. Exhort. Say, I can't wait to go to church. Well, what if something bad happens? Something bad will happen anyway. Yeah. Might as well just go to enjoy a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. That's good. Bad times will happen anyway. What if something bad happens? What do you mean, what if something bad ha happens? Something yeah. bad will happen. Yeah. Just, yeah. just get lost in the joy. Yeah. You don't have time to think about when that bad thing happens. Yeah. It's like when somebody cusses you out on street preaching. You're so lost in the joy of the Lord when you yeah. lead a soul to Christ, yeah. when you're hanging the word of God for all the world to see, that that just brushes off you. Yeah, yeah. it's good. <laughs> you know what will get you? You know, that verse says your heart hardened, right? You know, Jeremiah chapter 20, go to Jeremiah 20, and I'll close it here. Let me close it here. Let me close it here. Look at Jeremiah chapter 20. You know, when the heart is hardened, that the author warned, if you ever saw a dead, cold body, it's pretty hard, right? Yeah. Very stiff. Hard is like really hard, right? Yeah. But if the person was alive and the blood is hot, then what happens is the heart is beating. It's not hardened. So the opposite of hardening your heart is to keep it warm, keep it fiery. Yes. That's the opposite of hardening. When you harden your heart, you're cold, that turns stiff, and it deadens. But if you burn it up, just heat up that oven a little bit, then that heart can start beating. All right, you got a hardening issue, right? You feel dead, right? It's so hard, right, to get out of that hardening stage. You know what you need to do? Some of you need to do? You need to fire it up. Yeah. Look at Jeremiah 20. Look at Jeremiah 20. The Bible says about this person's heart at Jeremiah chapter 20, and he tried to get rid of the word of the Lord. Notice right here in verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shot up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearance, and I could not stay. Jeremiah can't harden his heart. He can't lose his joy of the Lord, even though he tried. He tried. He shut it up. He tried. But you know why he couldn't harden? That fire was burning. That fire was burning so hot that it made him sick in his stomach and it just made him dizzy. You know, some of you, you're like, man, I just feel so sick when I skip church. I let God down again. Oh, I just feel so bad. Good. Let your sickness just burn so much in your heart. Let that sickness burn in your heart where you just get so sick and tired of your stinking lazy flesh and you're like, get your butt into church. Yeah. Are you sick and tired of skipping your Bible reading and prayer? Good. 
be so sick and tired that, man, I just want to hear from God. I didn't hear anything from God. I'm so hungry. I've got a lot to say that I'm keeping it shut up in my heart, my issues, my problems. I got brethren around me, people around me who got so many issues and problems. I just got so much to say. I can't shut up. I can't stand this anymore. I'm feeling so sick, so weary. Good for you. Let it burn so deep that you'll finally fall on your knee and beg God for an answer to prayer and open up that book. You're sick and tired of seeing so many souls dying and burning in hell? Aren't you sick and tired of seeing so many false churches deceiving souls with wrong doctrine? Damning billions to hell? Are you sick and tired of what the school system, the government, and the world is spouting lies to the people, brainwashing people? Good! Be so sick and tired that you will drag yourself and open your mouth about Jesus Christ and pass out a track! Are you sick and tired of sinning? I know that, man. That sin is so corrupt. It just makes you filthy, right? Makes you filthy. Makes you let down God again. And you cry and you beat yourself over the head. Good. Get so sick and tired of keep beating yourself up that you're like, man, just, I want to get rid of this sin. I want to be clean. Just get a shower. Wash off all the filth. Just to be clean for one day. Just for one day. Be so sick and tired that you want it. You sick and tired of the garbage you're rummaging? Sick and tired of the filth? that you've been surrounding yourself in? Good! Be so sick and tired that you'll finally throw yourself for a shower. Good. How many of you are sick and tired? Are you content? You're content with the way you're living, huh? You're content with, I'm just okay with okay in and out in church, okay with my spiritual walk. You're content with that? I don't know about you, but you don't feel that fire? That fire that's so sick and tired Weary and weary, sick and tired, sick and tired, that it burns so deep and the heart cries out and beats and says, I just want to serve God. Every head bow and every eye shut.